Hey guys, Wallace C here. Hope that you're having a good week. Recently, I participated in the IGL, and that is the Infinity Global League. It's the sixth event uh, for them. And if you guys don't know what that is, it's uh, basically an Infinity ITS tournament that is held online using Tabletop Simulator. If you don't already know that uh, since the pandemic, um, playing Infinity online has become really massive. Um, we all use Tabletop Simulator, which is a great way of facilitating, you know, the maps and the miniatures and even the 3D, um, you know, renders and, and scans of our miniatures. Um, and a lot of competitions happen internationally, and Corvus Belli um, also now allows these to be, you know, ITS tournaments uh, that you know count towards the ITS system. And uh, this particular event, IGL six, was a satellite for the Interplanetario. So. It's officially sanctioned by Corvus Belli, and it has a fair bit of status, and quite a lot of people uh, signed up for it. I think 114 to 120 people. Um, that makes it um, the second big biggest TTS uh, event that I can think of. Back in the um, pandemic, um, I ran a few events at the time that were really massive just because, you know, it was the middle of the pandemic. So uh, the second big event we had there was something like 200 people, although the main field was more like 120, 130. Um, but uh, Tabletop Simulator is still going really, really strong, and I wanted to support this event by going along to it and participating, and in this video, I'm going to run you through my uh, experience with it, uh, and I was running Vanilla LF, so I'll be talking to you guys through my lists in a minute, and I'm going to be going through a little bit of a breakdown of what happened in the games and the overall out uh, outcome. My result, just to give you guys the spoiler, was that I placed 14th out of, um, I think, 114 people. I'm not too sure if that includes the people who started but didn't finish. But um, overall, I thought that was a very, very good result for me, considering the fact that I haven't been playing very much over the last year. I've been very much focused on my um, special uh, little YouTube show, Table Game Fun Times. By the way, if you haven't checked out Table, Dam uh, Table Game Fun Times, um, there is a, a bu bunch of videos on my channel. There's a playlist of them. Um, featuring some really cool stop motion animation like you're seeing on the screen right now. So have a look at this uh, card up here to check out Table Game for Names if you like. It's kept me really, really busy and I haven't had much time to practice. So going into this event, um, making it to 14th place was surprising given how um, you know inexperienced I was just with the, the short term. Obviously, I've got a lot of experience over the last seven or eight years, but just uh, a little bit out of practice recently. It um, would have really helped too if I'd actually practiced the actual uh, maps and the missions a bit more because that uh, itself is something which really gives you a boost. If you are playing competitively and you're going into ITS, I strongly recommend playing one practice game with each map and mission before the round starts. And that's the thing about Tabletop Simulator is you get to see the map uh, beforehand and having a uh, like a, a test game on it is, is, is a real big difference maker. Now I was running a left. A left did overall quite well in the event, but people are only saying that because you know some reasonably good players happened to pick a left this time. If those same players had just gone and chosen Combine Army or Cosmoflot instead, then we'd be saying different things. So you cannot look at results like that and extrapolate information about you know which factions are good and bad. It really is a whimsical thing that comes down to most of the experienced players. Although. That's not 100% true because there is the fact that very experienced players who want to win, who want to do really well at a tournament, typically will choose the S tier factions over the weaker ones, which is why you don't really see a lot of the weaker factions in the top 20 to uh, top top 50 kind of thing. I ran a left because I thought they were reasonably strong. Um, they weren't going to completely embarrass me, and I would have a shot at beating you know better players. And um, they're just kind of a fun faction, interesting to build. I feel like it's not just a matter of going to a single sort of net deck option for them and that's what sort of appealed to me about running them um i think that if i had been a bit more serious about you know winning more games maybe i would have played cosmoflot or a combined army a, a faction like that so yeah I, I was really happy with my my results i um i wasn't particularly unlucky or lucky um i played better towards the second uh, part of the, the event but let's just go through the games and and the lists and I will now take you through my run with Vanilla LF. Um, I'm not going to show you, by the way, I'm not going to show you all of the games on Tabletop Simulator with the footage, but I have clipped out some highlights to show you. That's why this video is, it looks quite long, is because I've taken out little bits of the six games that I played um, to show you uh, throughout. 
Without further ado, though, though, let's just go over to uh, the list. So my first list here is the Marut list. Um, I think that the Marut is, um, it's not about the individual tag. It's not about saying, okay, I really love this unit by on its own. It's really about what list can you achieve with it? And uh, is that list good in the meta? And I think that this is a very useful list because sometimes you're up um, against opponents on fairly wide open tables who will just put out a real really beefy ARO piece that um, you're just trying to work your way through, or they're taking a, a bit of a skew list that maybe has two Noctifer missile launchers in it, or just something with a lot of mimetism and, um, you know, Armand Lemieux it. A, a lot of people do just put these things in front of you and just expect you to sort of whack your way through them, and the Marut is the list that really answers that, because you put the smoke down with your Myrmidon, who's in group two, then the Mar Marut shoots it, and there is nothing in the game that can really stand up to that in the active turn there is no there is no arrow piece that can just like weather the attacks because even if the maru does get unlucky you've got the proxy mark one engineer just to repair it it's a willpower 15 repair and the maru with eight armor three structure points you're not going to lose it in your first round um so that's that's what it's there for it's the beat stick which makes sure that your opponent loses any arrow pieces that are, are sort of watching the whole table from partial cover so once you've got that in there, it's a matter of systematically building lists around it. Um, some people don't think the Shukra is worth it because uh, maybe because, you know, it's an all or nothing thing to take the Marut. And if the Marut, you know, dies, then that's it for you. I, I really disagree with that that view of it. One thing that can easily happen to the Marut is that they can put down a pitcher, um, a repeater next to it with Bittenkess or a Heckler and just isolate it. And if that happens, um, then you start and lost a lieutenant before you repair it. But the Shukra chain, chain of command does kick in. Um, if... Uh, if it does get isolated, so that's really, really important. Secondarily, um, this list absolutely can win if the Marut dies. You've got the, the post humans and you've got, um, you know, uh, a couple of other bits and pieces like the Myrmidon, Liberto, that can go and do damage. And if the Marut's already sort of uh, pulled a little bit of weight before it goes down, then you're fine. Um, diggers, absolute must, just absolutely crucial in a left because they are cheap and you need the points to spend on more expensive stuff, but they help defend your deployment zone. Uh, I'm not going to spend the whole video talking about this, but you just have to have to play diggers in, in vanilla LF at the moment. The TR bot is probably the only thing in the list which I find could be swapped out or changed around for other things. I did try the Naga Sniper at one point, but the TR bot is there really just because you want to buy yourself time to play an attrition game. It's so easy to revive it with your Willpower 15 Engineer. And you kind of need something to help deter and slow down the Polaris Bear Pods. The Marut doesn't do that particularly well because it's just going to do one wound at, uh, onto them at a time. And uh, they can just sort of bounce their way through. Whereas the, the, the TR bot really helps to shut that down. It also um, protects a lot lot of areas in your deployment zone from drop troopers and sort of people coming down from the back like Raziats and things like that. And again, since you already have the um, engineer in your list to support the Marut, then um, the Zayn is just already supported by that bit. So it's, it's kind of... Um, synergetic, so, so to speak. Um, the CSU and Bashi Bazooka are just there for ITS, so those are only for the missions that allow them. But everything else really is just there because, um, you know, you have the points for it. You have to keep everything pretty cheap. Um, this list previously did have um, a Beast Hunter instead of the War Core, but um, after they nerfed Net Rods by making them six points instead of four, I had to drop six points out of the list, and the nine-point... Um, nine point beast hunter came down to a three point war core and you still have um you know a pretty good list um after you've after you've done that so yeah despite the ne net rod nerf I, I still find this list is really strong there's nothing that i would change about it um as mentioned i mean the, the tr bot doesn't necessarily have to be there but um i i think it's the best choice um, one thing that this list can do in, in maybe turn one or turn two is if your opponent is uh, a bit flimsy and the table doesn't really suit their army very well and they're being a bit passive, it is possible to move the Marut um, from your deployment zone all the way to their deployment zone and just shoot everything you possibly can and end your turn with the Marut in their deployment zone, which um, usually will cause it to die. But um, it's possible to cause so much damage in that run um, and your opponent has to expend so much, you know, counter-attacking it that it could win you the game. I have played at least one game where that worked. Um, but the thing about the TR bot is that if you can position it so that it will be shooting anything on its way to the Marut, uh, then you've got a bit of a, a good sort of tactical situation set up there. 
Um, just remember the Marut with Stratagos and Tactical Awareness is basically giving you an extra couple of orders and the uh, Shukra has a counterintelligence. So if you are going first, this list is designed so that the um, Stratagos level two allows you to move something from group two over to group one. So if we just come back to this, so if you look at group two, um, imagine that you are gonna go for that run with the Marut. Let's pretend that you decide to bring this flash spot into group one um, using Stratagos. You've now got 10 regular orders in that group, plus the Lieutenant order, plus the Tactical Awareness order. So that's 12. They spend a command token stripping an order out of that because of counterintelligence means that it's, it's one rather than two. Now you have 11 orders to spend on your Marut. And um, look, this is not always gonna work and I don't always advise this. But um, it's cool that the list does have that option where you can just go all the way over the side of the other side of the board, um, shoot as many things as you can. When you move into line of sight of both a marker and something you can shoot, you can declare a discover shoot and you can become quite efficient like that. It's very tough, it can walk through mines. Um, but don't, don't do the strategy unless you really feel like it's gonna be worth it, you know. Um, more often than not, it's better just to you know, pick off the low-hanging fruit, shoot a few arrow pieces and go and hide the Marut. Or um, you could spend six orders moving out and shooting in the middle of the field and then spend five orders actually just physically pulling them all the way back to your deployment zone where it's safe. That is uh, a, probably a much stronger play in a lot more situations, but I like that this, this uh, list has a built-in way of punishing people that are being extremely passive and, and just avoiding your Marut, um, just strong arming things from, from long range like that. So yeah, um, it's, it, I don't think it's the perfect list. Um, there are ways around it. Um, it can be a bit flimsy if they can avoid the Marut and just um, pick off a lot of other stuff in your army. Uh, can get a little bit light and specialist sometimes. Um, it can be a good idea to move the proxies into group one at some point. But um, there is nothing really I'd change about this list even after the event. So let's now go to my other um, left list, which is over here. And this is a much, much different list. The thing that inspired me to run this was the experience of playing a single game on their Frostbite map, which um, at the time, before the event, was very badly designed. It was extremely open. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm gonna get so much of an opportunity to see huge sections of the map, why don't I just put in um, both Atalanta Hidden Deployment and the Agima Missile Launcher and support them both with two Yud bots from Mikaion and have them in partial cover. So um, I'm always getting an opportunity to shoot them off and possibly kill things. And um, even once they've gone down, I've got a whole other combat group to, to go out and, 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 and attack. Now, the Frostbite map did get sort of fixed before the event started, but um, I just went back and looked at all the maps and I thought, well, you know, my strategy is not any, any different here. I mean, they're both very strong uh, units. I can run this list if my opponent happens to be a sectorial player. Um, the, the Agima is just really punishing at the moment uh, in the meta against sectorials in particular. And if we go back to group one, um, even though group one has to do all the heavy lifting in terms of the actual objectives and the scenario, there's so much there that can still do that. So Penthesilia is extremely good at the moment. Um, people are agreed that after she got buffed, she's actually just uh, top notch. There's a variety of things that she does really, really well. So she can hang back and then in turns two or three, she can push out and safely go for an objective. It's a bit harder to do that with just the uh, proxy two hacker because it's sort of liable for being attacked right from the, the beginning of the game out in the midfield. Whereas Penthesilia can hold, hold out at the back and then just drive in very quickly. And if she needs to get into a room or through a tight gap, she just gets off her bike. Um, so with Mimetism 3, BTS 3, Bioimmunity, she's still relatively tough able to do that. Do that. Um, a monster in close combat with CC attack minus 6. And in this, this current era and meta of there being a lot of natural born warrior, CC attack minus 6 is better than martial arts level 2 or 3 or something like that, because it's more reliable in that sort of regard. The big weakness of Penthesilia is her physical stat of only 11. So although it's good that she's got smoke grenades now, um, it's just um, a bit unreliable with throwing the smokes down. So that is her one weakness, but still at 29 points, she's absolutely worth it uh, for the role that she plays in your army. Just that clutch late game presence of you know, reliably just driving out, tanking a bit of damage. She's got two wounds, immunity shock, um, even impetuous to get out there a bit quicker and, 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 and more effectively. Um, and she's not hackable for some reason. So uh, this is a very, very good piece. And um, I think that if you're gonna be playing a lot of uh, vanilla LF, uh, she should definitely be in one of, you, one of your lists. 
Everything else standard, diggers, 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 diggers. Um, with the difference here that McKeon is providing the 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 revival here with um, instead of the proxy Mark One being a doctor, my proxies are uh, around in a different order. So I've got the Mark Two. Always take the boarding shotgun Mark Two, Mark Four because the list um, has some really good arrow pieces, but nothing to just really shoot an enemy, you know, guy in a link team reliably or a TR bot. So, um, well, actually the TR bot, I mean, I'd be taking um, probably Atalanta um, through a smoke grenade to do that. But um, the HMG, I mean, your list should have one HMG if you can put one in there. So because this one doesn't have the Zayn rebot, the TR bot, I've got that. Proxy Mark 5 um, most of the time. Um, Dayleth rebot, sensor bot, obviously they're very good at the moment with Takamoto rule. And um, yeah, both the Agima and Atalanta. So you can sort of see here that McKeon, um will sit behind a wall and one of these two will be... Um, next to McKeon. So they may not realize that, because um, they're gonna see Yudbots on either side of the flank, they're gonna expect the two hidden deployment guys next to be the, both Yudbots. Um, but you can sort of trick them a little bit by putting just one of them there. But you can also put one Yudbot next to the uh, Mark IV. So really, um, the idea of McKeon here is to be able to use his Doctor ability to revive any of these three targets. The Mark IV, who's um, got shock immunity, um, or Atlanta, who also has shock immunity, that's huge. The Agima doesn't, so that's a bit of a detriment. But the thing about the Agima is that, you know, it's just such a powerful piece to um, A, threaten your opponent and make them just be super careful and scared when they're moving out, but B, but potentially punishing them if they just move around a corner on their second short skill. If you've um, if you've used a lot of skill in placing him in exactly the right spot, uh, he can be absolutely dev devastating. And look, if if he does whiff his attack and um, and doesn't really do much and just dies, uh, you know you haven't exactly lost the game. Um, it's a setback, um, and I think that. Um, this is a little bit of a skew list in the sense that it's got both the Agima and the Atalanta in there. But um, yeah, uh, if you're going to be playing Vanilla LF a lot, um, I mean, I still wouldn't change much about this list personally. But um, the other way you can run this is just have Atlanta, and that may be a lot more sensible. I think if I was playing another tournament, I might try um, you know an Achilles list with Atlanta and a, um, a proxy Mark One because then you can save the points a bit that way. And I think you, I think you could still have a, a Penthesilia in there. So with those kinds of pieces, um, this seems to be a really good way of playing Vanilla LF. Um, but this this list turned out to be really clutch. Um, McKeon and Penthesilia are both brilliant late game specialist move outs because of their smoke and you know in particular Eclipse uh, smoke over here. And um, you can defend very very well with your proxies and the diggers and your two hidden deploy deployment um, you know powerhouses I should say. Even the Myrmidon quite good on defense there. Um, and then for, for completing uh, missions, you know, you've got uh, Penthesilia, Mark II, Proxy Mark V, and McKeon, and the Dayleth. So you're very, a very, um, very, very capable of, of doing the missions. Um, I'll talk about the missions as we go through these games, but um, let me know what you think of my lists, guys. You're welcome to use them. Um, I think that they are very, very strong. And, you know, N4 in, in is a bit dry when it comes to list building possibilities. Um, after playing six games with these lists, I don't look back at them and go, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, I didn't quite win all my games, so I better change my lists. It's it's not really about that, you know. The the lists kind of build themselves these days. I mean, this this the game's not completely solved. There is still a lot of um, you know ways that you can change smaller things, but the backbone is there. I mean, you're always going to put the net rods in. You're always going to put the diggers in. You're always going to put you know um, the lamed rebots and stuff like that. And there's a big. Um, there's a big section of the faction which you just don't use. Like there's a whole bunch of units which just don't see any play whatsoever. And um, when you're when you're building a list, there's just like a little pool. There's a handful of units. You're just sort of handpicking one of them from there, which is a bit of a shame. But it's what it is. And you know, uh, if you want to play competitively ITS, you kind of have to have that mindset. So um, game one was a uh, firefight um, and that was against a Russian gentleman. Um, his discord name was in the Russian language. I'm not too sure what it is called. Cyrillic, I think it is. Sorry if I got that wrong, but um, I think the English approximation was Baton or um, a name similar to that. So I'm sorry if I've got his name wrong, but he was playing Tartary Army, Army Corps. So a left, forces, a left versus tack round one for firefight and um, I decided to run the Marut list, and um, for whatever reason, I had the first turn, and I decided to uh, primarily push forward with my diggers. 
So I had a digger that didn't get anything particularly interesting on his roll, but the the first turn digger went through. Um, oh, before I sort of just you know tell the story about the digger, let's just have a quick look at an approximation of his list. So this is not exactly what he ran, but just roughly speaking, um, he did take the HMG Spetsnaz and the boarding shotgun Spetsnaz. It might have been the rifle Spetsnaz, but it was the it was one of the drop trooper ones. Um, so yeah, the parachutist guy. It was one of these two. Um, I can't remember which one he took, um, but he did take two Spetsnaz, um, and then he took a few Irmandinos. There was one Dog Warrior. He did take four Strelok mine layers, from what I can recall. Um, this is sort of like a uh, like a camo spam midfield because they have decoy as well. So effectively, you're getting twelve camo markers out there as a result. Um, one of the reasons why TAC isn't super powerful in the meta as a result of that is that currently there are a bunch of things in the game that kind of deal with that strategy fairly well. You've got units like Diggers and like Tiger Creatures um, and peripherals like Pupniks which, which can quite easily dodge their way through the mines and then just kill the Strelox and you invest quite a lot um, in that um, as the TAC player. And secondarily, people are using Takamoto's quite a lot because they got buffed in the ITS to have, obviously, uh, tactical awareness and um, and marksmanship, and they start with sensor as well. So it's quite easy for one of those just to reveal the Strelok and his decoy and all the mines. Uh, and then, um, although they've got uh, Dog Warriors um, with Tak not having access to Unknown Ranger or uh, Bear Pods or Uxu McNeil, which are the, the big strong things, um, and their link teams aren't quite as good as the Volkalak uh, link team. They're not seen as like super top of the meta. Um, so he's got Verona in here, Vasily with a T2 sniper rifle, um, and we're playing we're playing firefight. So he's got to try and um, kill more than he loses with this. The Ermandinos are very good at firefight because their booty allows them to pick up the panoplies very very easily. Um, so yeah, um, everybody loves Umandinos. Just such a good point, for, um, just such a good unit for eight points, I should say. Um, really good set of equipment. Uh, so this is what we're basically up with um, the first round. Um, I will have got some of these profiles wrong, but just in general, the kinds of units that he's running here, this is a good representation, representation of, of his list, okay? So I'm going first, I've got my Maru list, and what happens is that I move up with one of my diggers, and the digger, destroys two Streloks. Um, then the Maru comes through and picks off an Ermandino to give him a way through. And then he comes through and he, he actually destroys the Spetsnaz heavy machine gun and he reduces the Dog Warrior to its very last wound in, you know, dog state. So that's one 14 point digger. Um, it's incorrect to tell people, oh, the digger's a really good unit because it had one really good game. That's that's a very bad way of making the case for diggers because there are other games where the digger just sits there and it's a 14 point cheerleader. leader. The reason why diggers, well, one of the many reasons why diggers are so good is that you've got a unit that is still useful even when it is just 14 points, but some of the time it's just gonna go an absolute tear and other times it's gonna trade with an expensive unit. But this particular game, I absolutely just whacked him turn one. And um, in terms of the mission being firefight, um, I was just so, so far ahead. Um, I had a Marut, which was on the same side of the table as the wounded dog warrior, and I didn't want him coming over in close combat with me. I did put the Marut in partial cover to um, to basically shoot back at him and to really dominate the table because I knew that his heavy machine gun Spetsnaz was dead. So I was feeling very overconfident, but I would like to play you guys a bit of a clip about what happened to the Marut uh, right after that in his uh, you know responding first turn. Let's take a look. My camo. Just going to here. Yep. And uh, from cover, he just see your uh, attack. Okay. So I guess I delay. I gonna reveal and shoot you. All right. T two sniper rifle. That's very powerful. Okay. What are you gonna do? Uh, shoot you back. Okay, that's the station. That's your minus. Yep. My you minus six. I have just plus three and minus three. Okay. Okay. Now you you shoot nine. I shoot thirteen. 
Good luck. So okay. I, think you, I think you deserve to kill me after all the bad luck you had with your other troops. <laughs> uh, hopefully, but I don't shoot. Good luck, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, two saves from you. Okay, let's just see if I die straight away. Um, very painful. Oh, you died! Wow, okay, mm. good game. Okay, so that happened. Um, unfortunate luck there. But let's just break down um, what really um, we can take away from uh, something like that happening. This was a, a situation where he, his best option was to attack me with a, a like a T2 sniper rifle. And um, if he doesn't do this, then basically he's just letting his opponent run away with the game. So giving him a chance to attack and potentially take down the Marut in that situation is the best thing that he can possibly do. It is really risky because with a, a sniper rifle, you've got two shots and the tag has one shot. So you have to try and you know land both hits there, but it's it's difficult. I mean, you're not always going to get both hits through. If you get just one hit through, the tag is at armor 8 plus 3 for cover. That is 11. So saving on a 6 plus on a d20 and you're doing absolutely nothing, which means that you're typically having to shoot at it and shoot it and shoot it. It's order after order after order. And as soon as you you know, miss both shots, or if the Marut lands one hit on you, well, that's an explosive hit and you lose your guy. So, yeah, it was a really uh, rough situation for him, but even though he had to take that risk, and I could easily have just, you know, won the game there and there, um, it was still a big blunder from me. There was no need for me to have my Marut watching that part of the table, knowing that there was a possibility of a T2 sniper. I obviously hadn't seen his list, and I didn't know what was underneath the camera markers, but I had to have known it was a possibility. And giving him a way to get back into the game is on me. That's a mistake that's made by me, not my opponent. I feel like even though he took a really awful risk there, he kind of had to, whereas I didn't need to sort of, you know, leave the Marut sitting there. And the problem with it is that we're playing a mission where killing the lieutenant is a really big deal. Doesn't matter if I've got chain of command, the Marut is worth a massive number of points and he's worth, you know, more objective points for being the lieutenant as well. So gives my opponent to be ahead on army kills and lieutenant and uh, I could have easily just put him in, in, in total cover. I was a little bit worried that uh, something else might come at me from that flank, you know, his uh, Bashi Bazook drop trooper or his dog warrior coming down sort of through where that, that alleyway was through the building at the top. But I mean, that was just really pointless concerns. What I should have done is just kept the Marut completely back and uh, the game would have just been um, pretty much over after that initial push with the, the digger. So yeah, an embarrassing blunder, I think, starting the tournament with a bad play. After um, bringing the game back a little bit, you know, chain of command was fine, you know, in my turn I was able to consolidate a little bit and I'd still killed so much of his army that I was uh, I was still in it in terms of, you know, more specialist kills and getting stuff from the panoplies and more army points. And um, what I did in, um, in one of my earlier turns was I got my proxy mark five with SMGs in a position where, you know, if he just left it there, I could potentially make a run on his lieutenant. So... I moved the proxy um, up a wall, like completely scaled the wall, broke his way through a window, and then went through the architecture of the terrain, terrain that I myself built in Blender, by the way, thanks, me. Um, and then we're going to watch another clip here where the uh, proxy decides to go after his lieutenant, Voronin. So he comes down the elevator and just tries to shoot him point blank, and let's just see how that one worked out. So I'll spend the next order, and I'm going to come down the elevator, so... I'll go down a level, and he drops down. Okay. And I gonna go out attack you? Um, okay, I will use a nanopulsor. You haven't a nanopulsor. Don't I? Some machine oh, gun, two right. plus oh, one burst. Oh my fucking god, I thought he had a nanopulsor the entire time. Oh my <laughs> god, that's so stupid. <laughs> Maybe it's not worth doing. Um, if I, I won't if, fight me like if I you you win. If I get um, an EM grenade on you, that's your your um, doesn't count as null state, does it? Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna shoot my uh, SMGs. See if I get lucky. Okay. Okay, I you shoot with uh, plus three and minus three. That's going to be uh, 13, yep. and I kick you with uh, 25. Come on. Yeah, um, okay, so that's just, I mean, it was, it was a dumb thing for me to have done. 
It was really stupid. Uh, and one. My attack. Uh, I, I shoot. Yep. And you must go safe. One save. Um, 13. Oh, what's your damage? Uh, my damage is 13. Uh, th th 13 is a pair, but you have armor. Armor 3. I... Yeah. So not exactly my finest moment this game. Um, another massive blunder, just completely forgetting that the proxy um, doesn't actually have a nanopulsar. This is after spending like six orders, you know, parkouring his way through the building and eventually just like coming down the, the elevator and blasting his SMG at Veronin and thinking that um, the Veronin would just uh, attack with the, the guard dog effectively and I could just zip him with the nanopulsar and then with my NWI have another go at it if you pass the BTS. But uh, I'm just stupid, you know, I just hadn't practiced the game, just wasn't really up to speed, so it's just my own fault. And Veronin didn't end up dying at all. So what happens after that is that we're both sort of just trading blows. Both of us are fairly crippled at this point. I'm ahead on army points, but he's um, ahead on killing my lieutenant. And it really just came down to special skills and, um, and panoplies. There was one final clip that I want to show you just for fun where... He's brought on his parachuter Spetsnaz, and he's locked himself in combat with my Myrmidon. And both of these guys, surprisingly, are quite evenly matched in terms of um, like martial arts ability and like close combat stat ability. So they're basically just tra trading knife blows and just back and forward. And I just got to show you this last little encounter. Let's take a look. Uh, your Spetsnaz is it a specialist? Uh, no. No. All right, I'll spend the regular order on the Myrmidon and see if I kill you. So let's both roll. Okay, come on. Here comes my roll. I, I, I attack with the chargers, my last the chargers. I got an 18. Come on. Oh, uh, no. So it. what is your weapon? So it's a, um, it's a double you have action, double action. I've got a crit as well. No, you haven't crit because you're 20, 21. 21. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so two saves. Two saves. Come on, Spitznas. <laughs> yes, Spitznas. <laughs> okay, um, spending. I gotta eat your children. You said Spitznas. <laughs> spending another regular order. I'll attack again. So here we go. I'm gonna roll. Here a we go. Eleven. Yeah, it's your chance. And my attack. Come on, Spitznas. Fucking. Two saves. Come on, Spitznas. You can do it. Yes, Spitznas, do it. What's his armor? Two. <laughs> Okay, my damage is, my damage is 15, though. Yes, you you cannot kill my space nas. Yeah, ah, uh, okay. Come on, you All have right. another one, Rick. <laughs> we'll spend the last one, fine. Um, here we go, I'm gonna roll. I'm gonna roll. Only a six, so it's your chance to win now. It's my chance. Oh! The <laughs> three three time in a row. And come on, space nas. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. It's not justice. All right, so what ended up happening in that game is after the dust settled, um, he had killed more lieutenants than me because he got my Marut and I didn't get Veronin. But I had killed more points worth of stuff because the Marut was the main thing that I lost and he ended up losing like all of his uh, Streloc mine layers and he lost his dog soldier and he lost um you know uh, like one of his scouts or whatever he had there and i managed to generally hold it together with the diggers and the post humans just fending everything off so um you know we both got an even number of points there and i think our specialist kills were similar and our panoply uh, grabs were actually similar in the end um he did sort of contest the idea that um, and Ermodino grabbing multiple things from the panoply um, is worth a certain number of points. Um, after we checked we check the rules, we found that if you grab multiple things from the same panoply with the same guy, it doesn't count as additional uh, iterations of getting stuff out of the panoply. So uh, due to that, um, he sort of didn't quite understand it 100% uh, there. Due to that, it managed to be a draw in the end. So not the, not the finest start, as you guys can sort of see from those clips and my sort of explainer of the game. Um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't really a well-played game for me because I, I missed out on other opportunities to win. I shouldn't have left my Marut there, and even in the follow-up when I went to go after Veronin, I should have just gone and grabbed more panoplies with that proxy Mark V, and I would have been absolutely fine, would have won the game, no trouble. So, without further ado, let's take a look at the next game. 
All right, so moving on to ground number two, we were playing against um, Tanguska for this one, and my opponent was Journey, who is a, a Russian player who uh, I met during the uh, the first TTS uh, events of the pandemic. Um, he started playing a lot of my leagues and things like that. He is sort of, you know, he's really been the voice of the Russian community um, in a lot of things because he was sort of like the team leader of the, the Russian team in some of our events. And, um, you know, very good player. I, I played him only one time before, in fact, I was playing a left that time as well, but he was playing military orders, and I barely managed to win that game, and now I'm up against him again. He does play against a lot of very good, competent players in the Russian meta, so I'm expecting a strong opponent for this one. And the mission was um, a variation, like a custom mission of Highly Classified. Nobody really likes Highly Classified, but they've decided to bring in this version of it where you can choose your classified cards at the start. So um, you each choose two of the classified cards, and um, if they're the same ones as your opponent's ones, I believe that they have to be switched out or something like that. I can't quite remember the mission, but you can check the IGL League website if you want to read up a bit more about it. But it's just like a version of Highly Classified where the um, the missions that you're going to be doing are a little bit more reliable. So it's less likely you're just going to be randomly drawing one which is good for one person but not the other. So um, we'll look at that shortly, but um, the main idea is that he's playing Tanguska. This is not the list that he was running. It's just, you know, a rough representation of what I can remember of his list. I know that he was running the Securitate link with Perseus and Grenza. I know he had an Interventor Lieutenant. I know that he had the Puppet Master, Puppet Bots, and the Heckler. I know he had a Meteor Zond, and the rest of it um, I can't quite remember, so I've just filled it out with a few random Tanguska units. So um, there's nothing particularly meta-breaking or special about this list, but it is actually very good for a mission like Highly Classified uh, or Klyly Hassified is, is the variation name that they used. Um, because uh, the specialists in it are very good and um, it's quite good at defending with the puppet bots and the, the, the hacker jammers and stuff like that. And um, with the level of hacking that it does, it can be very good at completing some of those classifieds which require hackers. And um, the real big play he's got is the Meteor Zone, not something I was expecting him to have. Um, and it's a great way of coming in towards the end of the game and, you know, doing things with the, the, um, the HVT and so forth and so forth. Um, in in the first turn, I managed to um, move my Maru to secure my own HVT and move it because I knew that he'd, uh, he'd be trying to complete some of the classifieds on my HVT. So I, I brought that to safety. But with his... Um, his civilian, his HVT being in a position which I could just sort of go for it, I sent in my Shukra because there were quite a lot of, um, uh, of cards that I could complete with just the Shukra. But um, I'm going to play you guys a little clip just in a second, just to sort of show you what's happening. Um, and, and this clip is going to be for my first turn. Um, after this clip has showed, the Marit goes and grabs the, the HVT, but the Shukra is able to move out against his HVT and try and complete some cards. Let's just have a look at how that plays out. Um, is there anything else that he can do on it? I don't think he can. Um, he will just keep moving. Not him. Okay, flip the next regular order. He's going to uh, get line of fire to the guy. Like this. Did you accomplish uh, that in the mind? You need, we need to put something down, right? No, I, I didn't. I didn't roll for it. Oh, you didn't roll it. Okay, yeah. so, so, so I, now, I was, now I'm going to attempt um, net undermine now. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, no, I, identity check is what I'm doing now. Okay, so here comes identity yeah, check. Yeah, I want to I wanna check uh, line of uh, his zone of control from my marker, from him to my marker. Okay. Yeah, so it he is in range. Okay. So you moved here. Yeah. Before you do anything else, I will reveal my jammer guy, and he'll try to jammer him. Oh, very nice. Okay. Um. What was the range? It's seven and seven. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what I need this. to roll for the um, identity check? That's a willpower roll. Okay, I'll just try the whip 14. Okay, I'll try to jammer you. Oh, I already, I already rolled it. I got a 13. Oh, you did. Okay, sure. I failed anyway. Um, so I don't get a guts check, but I do complete net undermine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get a faction marker, and I'm just going to place it next to the one that I've completed. Yeah, it's a great idea. We actually can take one of these. But yeah, if you yeah. if you don't mind, get, get mine as well. Oh, yeah, sure. 
it will be lagging for me for sure. Uh, don't go so I'll just place it nearby so you can use it. Um, okay. So I'll spend another regular order and he will move out of range of the jammer. And he's going to come to here. Uh, I'll try to jammer him again for what it was. Um, and I will attempt to do um, net undermine. And I rolled oh, 18. So if you run out of jammer? Yeah, I do. Oh, I guess lucky. it's disposable. Okay, roll a five, so net undermine's completed. Um, very lucky. And then I just need to run away. Okay, so looking at that clip, I actually feel like my opponent outplayed me because he had the heckler in a position where he knew I'd be coming after his HVT and he had the jammer there. And uh, you could even see him sort of just having a look at where the zone of control was going to be and just anticipating that play. He got really unlucky to just waste both of his jammer attempts and not even you know isolate my guy. So I got incredibly lucky there. So he'd kind of played that well, but um, if I had um, just been a little bit better with either the Shukra or even just used the, the proxy Mark II to do it, we were talking about this after the game, um, I possibly could have even completed all classifieds within that turn. And that sort of is the strategy um, just get four really easy classifieds in play, um, just complete them straight away and then spend the rest of the game just defending your, um, your HVT or something like that so your opponent just gets all but one. I think that it's a really, really bad mission. Um, everybody agrees that it's much better than... Um, a highly classified, the Corvus Belly version of it, but it's not really hard to be better than a, like an awful mission like that. Um, some people do like the mission, but um, one thing we saw, um, you know, quite a bit in Discord was people explaining how this uh, mission quite often leads to draws because it's so easy for both players to to get all of the uh, objectives. It's also a little bit of a weird one with scoring, where um, like really high scoring games are just very very common. What you want with your missions is there to be a, a nice spread of outcomes. Like some people have like a 2-0 win, other people have like a 5-4 win, sometimes there's a 10-0 win, occasionally there's like a 10-6 win, but um, all of the results tend to be skewed in, in sort of one, di one direction. Anyway, um, what happens uh, after this play is that the Shurka runs off, I've completed a couple of, cl couple of classifieds, and my opponent uh, attacks back with his link team, and he moves like everybody across the board and completes a couple of classifieds of his own, and sets up his Grenza in a position where he wants to defend um, the position of his like Interventor and a Securitate team, even though they're on my side of the table, he wants to defend them against the um, the Marut coming through. And I know at this point that his Interventor is his Lieutenant, and he's not in impersonation state. So the Marut is going to make a play for his uh, Lieutenant here uh, by moving out, shooting the Grenzer, which he does, and then moving around the back of my deployment zone to try and kill um, his Interventor and just make it harder for him to uh, complete more classifieds after that once he loses a Lieutenant. Let's just take a look. Does the Interventor still have a Fast Panda that he can use? No, no, it's only disposable one. So both of my Fast Pandas are gone. Okay. I'm going to give it a try. So I'll spend the regular order on the Marut, and he's going to move... Wait, uh... wait, 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 wait. You know what? He doesn't actually have a, a Fast Panda. The Lieutenant Profile doesn't get one. Oh my god. So he, you're fine without repeat, actually. Wow, okay, that does make a difference. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll then try to use it to complete data scan. Okay, that's, I, was I think that's fair. I think that's fair. So make your yeah, it's, it's actually great to check it right now. It would have been, yeah. it would have been a disaster if uh, if I didn't realize it. So I'll just try to roll fifteen against him, yeah. and complete it. Okay, so quite interesting. There was a bit of a misplay here where my opponent um, had a repeater down on the table that he shouldn't have, and he realized it later on. And this is not a criticism criticism of him. We all make mistakes like this, including me during games. But it was an interesting one because before this play happened, I was looking at the board and looking at where my Maru could potentially move in from, and uh, the route that I took was based on like where his hacking area was. So um, it was a bit awkward that after my Marut had made, you know, a few orders and, and a few few moves that we had to uh, remove the repeater because it wasn't meant to be there in the first place. But my opponent generally had a good position set up. Um, it, had took, it took more orders than I expected from to, for the Marut to kill his, um, his Grenza, but eventually, 
I did get all the way around uh, with the help of my proxy shooting at a few Securitates. Uh, the Maru does shoot his Interventor. I basically have it sitting there in the back line. And um, unfortunately, I've lost my Shukra. So if he kills the Maru as well as the Shukra, then I'm, then I'm a lost lieutenant for my turn. And it makes it even harder for me to pick up the last couple of classifieds. Let's let's have a look at what happens uh, when he's a lost lieutenant and he's got the Maru sitting right in front of Perseus. Um, here is the clip. Okay, so what I'm gonna do with my Perseus? Doesn't he have any? No, he doesn't. Which is isn't great, but I guess it's alright. So my Perseus will activate with um, his own order. Let's say this one. Mm. Will you be able to see him with a Maruti? You will be. Only if you move out to this side. You can you can come and come next to this without being seen. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna come and cover, and uh, also touch his zone. Okay. Of terrain, like this. Yep. Any errors? Uh, I'll try and dodge with these guys here if they're in range, but if they're not, then nothing. They're definitely in range, I think. No, I'll oh, no. the digger. This one is, yeah. I'll take with the digger. And uh, what Marut will do? Oh, you come in line of sight? Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. I want to see him. Uh, and, uh, take his own... Explosive round with um, HMG. Okay, I will break your combi, you. Which is three shots on 16s, and you are minus nine. Uh, uh, no, minus. No, you're minus. Yeah. Uh, no, he. Oh, yeah, because you ignore my. That's right. Yeah. So three 16 on 16s against one on 12s. Come on. A nine. Oh, I got two hits. And uh, So two saves, so two saves half BTS. Um, I think I'm dead. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. He's damage 14, right? You, you are unconscious. Because he's plus damage uh, oh, on the nice. rifle. All right, so after losing my Marut in um, his responding turn, um, which is kind of painful. I mean, if the if my turn had gone better, I could have repositioned the Marut or put in suppression fire or um, you know just just played 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 better with it just in general. Um, I would have had a chance of picking up the like the last one or two classifieds that I couldn't get, but unfortunately at the end of my third turn I hadn't completed all the classifieds and what he was able to do is quite easily move out his puppet bots and you know shoot flash pulses at my HVT which is in a corner. Um, unfortunately, although the, the Marut had previously like picked up the HVT to synchronize with it, I, I let it go again so I could move after his lieutenant, which turned out to be a bit of a mistake. Um, but the clutch thing really was that Meteor Zond just being able to sort of land right next to where it needed to and using the repeater from the, the uh, Meteor Zond to pick up the last um, few classified. So my opponent did manage to get all of the classifieds done and I didn't quite get all of them. So he did manage to, to win, um, but well played. I feel like his preparation for that mission was better than mine and his game plan for that mission was better than mine. So he, he did deserve to win, even though there are things that I could have done differently or I even though I was unlucky in some some places, you know, I think he deserved the win better uh, more than me. So that means after two rounds, I had drawn a game and I lost a game. So I, you know, was kind of submarining at this point. Submarining means to do poorly in the first round or two of the tournament and then play against people who maybe are less experienced than yourself to sort of build yourself back up to the, the top. So over the next four games, that is pretty much what happened, to be honest. So let's now take a look at the list um, for game three and the mission for game three that uh, we went to, to next. Going into round number three, we're up against more rats. These are being played by a gentleman by the name of Data Tracker. Um, I think his name is Don Corcoran or something like that. He's played in a couple of my events on TTS a while back. More gone into the real life games um, as a lot of people have nowadays. But he's still playing some more rats. And uh, let's have a look at his list. He's decided to run um, a core link of four or five data ratsies, which all have the 14 point chain rifle um, this is a fun one um, they are so good at just throwing smokes and swarming people with close combat and they're deadly at close range with the chain rifle and they don't really need a long range gun in some cases but my my criticism of this list is that sometimes they do need something a bit more long range because you've got access to such amazing um you know wild cards in this list you know i i don't I don't see why you can't just throw in like something with a gun over here because the data artsies don't really need the benefit of the five man core bonus. 
So if you've got a Data Rise five a fire team here, you could just put your Rakterak, so you have one specialist with them, maybe a guy with the Red Fury or something like that, or you put Anya with them. Um, that's probably the way that I would I would play it, but it is what it is. He's running the five Data Rise. And then he's running um, something which looks a bit more like a typical sort of um, more Atling team with Kornak, so yeah, Yalgat, Dartok, Kaitok. You get a ton of utility, amazing long range shooting here. The Yao gets firing through smoke all day. Uh, the Dartok very strong, obviously, with the firewall um, buffing him up as well there. And Kornak dishing out a ton of orders along with the tactical awareness order. Um, from memory, he had some sort of three man link team, including the Osnat and the Preter. I can't remember whether that involved Anyat or the Preter as well. We'll get to that later. But this is just, again, a rough approximation of the list. And I think Morats are in a, in a good place at the moment. I mean, they are not S tier because they don't have um, anything, you know, to to the level um, of the the Morans or the Bearpods or Betonkiss, but they are very strong because they can form uh, like pure link teams very easily, and they have some very good efficient profiles like the Dartok and the Kaitok. Um, but they still ultimately have to build their lists with, um, you know, a few pieces that aren't exactly optimal. So they're not like a hundred percent there, but they are still a pretty good solid of a solid competitive, um, sort of faction. Now my opponent was going first and, uh, for this particular game and for the remainder of games, I'm actually running my McCown list with Penthesilia and the Agima and, um, Atlanta. So, um, what he's, he's doing, and remember this is a, a mission, um, where we're playing, I think the Armory. So I'm going second, which is crucial for that mission. You just really want to go second in that one because it's about moving into the room in your active turn and then scoring at the end of every game round. So going second is so important there. But my opponent going first, possibly because he doesn't fully appreciate you know, that part of how the mission goes or because he feels like he needs the Alpha Strike. I think we talked about that a little bit and I think he just wanted the Alpha Strike. So in his first turn, he runs forward with all of the Dataratsis and of course, I've got the Agima Missile Launcher just waiting there. So let's have a look at the clip. Which one's the link leader? Um, it's probably going to be this guy who's in the middle. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so that was one, two, three, four, five. There you go. That's my first. I don't think any arrows. Uh, right? There will be. Um, oh, there are? Okay. There is. Yeah, I'm just going to bring out this Agima, Agima missile launcher. He is over here. Oh, I forgot. Hidden, hidden deployment. Awesome. So he'll shoot a missile with a template at that guy, but as, as far back as I can get. So wherever he started is where the missile will Got Gotcha. Mm. So you'll just hit the two of them? Yeah, but they could just dodge. Yeah. Um, I think I will, in fact, dodge. Okay. Just quickly check that range from the top of the thing there. So it's just over 24. I'm on a 16, and you're probably on a 14. So yep. this will be compared against both guys. I'll need a little bit of luck here. What am I going to get? Um, 15. Wow, we both failed. No, I, I hit because right. I'm on a 16. Oh, you hit. Oh, you're on a 16. Okay, so you hit that one guy. Let me roll for the other guy. I mean, I'm going to roll for all of them, but... A one, that's not good enough. Uh, I I need to crit right for these yeah. for those two. So they're both gonna get wiped out. Um, and then let me roll for the other two dudes. I'm not rolling against anything. Plus. He makes it. He Plus. makes it, and then the guy furthest forward makes uh, does not make it. Okay. okay. So it's just these two here. I'll just do yeah. these their moves real quick. Don't move into the template, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a dodge, no. actually. That that one won't matter because it's resolved uh, at the end. Yep. Right, right. So they go three inches to there. And again, his buddy's basically just right behind him. They were kind of yep. together. All right. So I'm going to roll um, the the fire team lead. I totally forgot about the Gamma. That, that's a good, good show. That's okay. um, I'm sure he's going to be very dead. <laughs> And he is. Uh, and then the second guy there. All right, and thus ends the reign of the Datarazi. 
So you can kind of see how powerful the Agima actually is. I mean, this is in a situation where my opponent sort of isn't really anticipating the Agima Missile Launcher, but at perhaps a higher level of play, you're going to be up against opponents who know that it's coming. They know that the opponent has the Agima, so they are perhaps um, are spreading out their guys a bit more or only moving them a few guys at a time. But the, the power of that model is that you can force your opponent to avoid certain plays that would otherwise be quite good. So it's still a, a really, really strong piece. And um, sometimes you can deploy it so cleverly that you're able to just, you know, pick up kills with it um, just in, in a very clutch and important way, just regardless of what your opponent um, really does. And it, it it's, just a, it's just a way to outplay people in some cases. I feel like the missile launcher shouldn't really be in hidden deployment. Um, if you're going to give something MSV2 and a missile launcher, it should probably just have like limited camouflage or something like that. And let the sniper and the Mark 12 or whatever else it has have the hidden deployment options. But we got to a point where my opponent decided just to move in with his other link team. So he moves out with the Yalgat, shoots the Agima through the smoke. Um, the Yalgat does that perfectly. Um, so the, the Dataratsis don't really get anything done. But the rest of his um, army does move forward. And my opponent decided to make the very aggressive and bold play of just moving his entire, you know, Kornak, Suryat link team right in front of my guys. Like, they're literally almost in zone of control of my whole army, uh, right next to the objective room. And that gives me a chance to simply just spend every order I have just picking them off, moving around corners and just shooting bits and pieces at them. Unfortunately, my first turn um, responding to him doing that was very, very unlucky. Um, I pulled guys out of cover and just tried to pick them apart. And tactically, I played very well, but the dice just didn't really go my well. Wait, let's just have a quick look at one example of, of that sort of playing out. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, spending a new order on him, he is just going to pop around the left here, just enough to see the Kaitog, and then he's going to fall back to here. Sounds good. I'm going to uh, I'm going to drop um, double flaming spheres on you. Well, that sounds painful, uh, but we'll mm -hmm. give it a go. So it's within sixteen for both of us. Uh, so yep. zeros. I'm on. Your, uh, Come on! Come on! Need some luck here. Oh, 10's my best. Speedable. That's really, that's really good. Uh, not really. <laughs> I have to basically crit in order. I need 12's. There you go. 12, come on. Oh, there it is. Crit! There it is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Our first crit of the game. Ouch. As I mentioned, this particular turn, which is my starting turn, um, you know, Armory, again, is a mission where you want to counterattack quite a lot. So your opponent plays their first turn, you play your second turn and move straight into the armory and just beat whatever's in there. My retaliation turn one uh, wasn't going well at all. So um, he had his Kaitok and his Suyats there, and I was just shooting him with my proxies and um, various different elements of my army, my digger, just trying to get something done. But everything was just falling over. On the other side of the, the board there, what I attempted to do was move through with my send spot, and Atalanta was helping out on that side of the board. Atalanta had picked off a member of his link team, I think Anyat, as he was moving across with his um, Osnat and Preta. So what I decided to do is move after them with my sensor bot, try and gun them down with the combi rifle. But um, when it got to me opening the doors of the room in my turn, um, unfortunately, I kind of had not really anticipated how the play was going to work out here, and we're about to witness another comical blunder from me. Again, this is why you practice you, the, the maps and the missions before you play events, guys, but let's just have a look at this fun little interaction. Okay, I'll, I'll just try and open the door. So, yep. rolling for the door, and it's a three, so all of the doors open. And then I will roll my dodge. This is for the Prada. That is a, I forget if they're 13s, they are 14s, and then this is for the Osnat. Now, that happens a resolution, and your resolution happens before my resolution as the active player. So, they will move in. Okay. Uh, go. Are we 100% are we sure about that? Yeah, the active turn player always goes first in in that uh, exchange. Just see what the, the door rule says on that. So one of them got into the room? 
Yeah, the um, the Prada went into the room. Okay. So as you guys can see, this uh, was not really expected or well played by myself. Um, I thought I was be, being really clever by, you know, going second and giving myself a chance to sort of just slow him down and then move into the room um, whenever it was the end of the game round and just picking up objective points in that way, making it really hard for him to win. But in this situation, um, I open the doors, there's a Preta there which is able to dodge into the room and the Oznat's able to come as well and every time I'm trying to sort of, you know, shoot him, more stuff's dodging into the room. So it was kind of like a harebrained, bumbling sort of situation that uh, didn't work out very well for me. So unfortunately it meant that my opponent sort of started scoring a bit earlier than I did and also was in a strong sort of central position in the game where he's just like, he's got Kornak and he's got the Suryats, he's got everything in there. Um, so it turned out, I mean, despite me getting the good shot with the Agima and generally outplaying him, um, it started going quite badly because of, of, of luck, really. Um, I finally eventually managed to get a bit of a break um, when his Yaogat uh, went after my proxy Mark IV HMG. So he's got Burst four on the active turn, just absolutely obliterates everything it shoots with the, the Sniper. But finally, I managed to get a little bit of good luck, a lucky break, and the Agima, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, Mark, the proxy Mark IV HMG gets an Aero crit on the Yaogat, killing it. And I was able to just sort of stall him mid turn, really, where um, his link team had lost a member or two, wasn't quite able to get what it wanted to do, and also had to move into the room at the same time to continue that, that, uh, that tempo. And um, just generally put me in a position where I still had enough stuff to continue, like, um, just pelting him with different attacks from different directions and get the game towards a point where I would be able to go into the room and secure it at the end. And um, getting the panoplies and the room in the, in the very final game round is important because you get points for being being in the room in the final turn as well as every game round and the, the final turn is one of the game rounds. So it really all uh, came down to that. This is very close. Spinning the, the, the sort of here, she will go into close combat now. So that gives you the chance right. to... I'm, I'm still gonna I'm still gonna shoot you. I'll swing Okay, now you can't hack while you're in close combat. Is that right? Um, Correct, okay, correct. Yeah, All right. Here is her her here's her um, her role um, So oh, that will be a crit Ah, Damn it. So two against <laughs> yeah. the monofilament. He's, he's done No, he's lives he lives, but he's he's in CC, which yeah. is bad. So let's just measure it out. I'm, I'm going to be very careful about this. We have three orders. So if I just copy-paste my guy, um, the first move would basically get him to this spot here. Right. So he's, he's essentially going to get there. Then he's not going to um, provoke any dodges or hacks. But the second one is going to get him to there, right into the room. So yep. that would allow you to dodge, but then the third one is going to come over here and grab that. All right. Well, this is it. It comes down to this one roll. <laughs> well, he automatically he automatically gets the panoply. Oh, he automatic. Oh, that stinks. But if you pass oh, if you, you pass your dodge when he gets to this point, there's a possibility of you responding to him and, and killing him by shooting him. But um, that's not going to because I could dodge. But that's but that's not going to stop you from pushing the panoply. Yeah, I don't think so. Right. So just to explain how the end of, of that particular game happened, I managed to get to a point where uh, Penthesilia had dismounted and moved into the room. That miniature you saw, which looked like a Hippolyta model, was just a proxy for my Penthesilia uh, dismounted. And he really just had the, the Dartok in the room at the end. I'd finally managed to get so many trades with, you know, diggers and posthumans onto his main link team that he was, was left with little other than that. And Penthesilia manages to move into the room, and instead of going directly for the Dartok, she actually goes for the panoply to even up the number of panoplies that each of us have taken um, and then uh, go after the Dartok and um, being in close combat with him meant that I had just enough orders at the end to move the digger through into the room and with the digger having booty it was able to pick another thing off the panoplies to make sure that my opponent didn't have more panoplies than me and that way I could actually take the room in the last game round and um, also fully for, for the, the end of the game and I just barely had more objective points than him so Overall, um, I'm sorry I couldn't sort of show you guys more of this game. I could upload it into YouTube because it was kind of a funny one. 
But um, even though I generally played better in a lot of those situations, the dice kind of made it very, very close. And, and, and because of like that clutch, clutch ending with Penthesilia just managing to make it and surviving against the Dartok, I was able to move the digger uh, and sneak past into the room for a bit of a win, um, which was important uh, because otherwise I would have been, you know, two losses and a draw um, halfway through the event. But we managed to get a win. So at this point in the event, it's one win, one loss, one draw, fairly even going into game number four. So let's take a look at our next match. Going now into game number four, I ran up against the dreaded Nomads list. This is it, the vanilla Nomads list, the, the net decked list. And uh, playing against Azuzet, who's a, a lovely guy, he actually won the best sports award in my very first, first TTS event back when the pandemic broke out. And we gave him a, like a little HVT model, which had a picture of me on it, and he still uses it. Um, so Azuzet's a lovely guy. Um, and, and we agreed that N4 is not great at the moment for list building, and he'd, he's decided just to net deck it to give himself you know a good shot in the, in the tournament and I, I respect that but um this is a list i complain about all the time it includes all of the most broken undercosted nomad stuff and it, it really is fearsome um the the grouping of the miniatures i've i've picked out here isn't accurate but this gives you an idea of what's in the list so a few a few reasons why it's so strong. This is an incredibly defensive list, with the Morans being there and and uh, Jazz and Billy being able to to hack anything that walks past them. But um, if you have any AROs to defend against it, the Salamandra can easily just rip anything up with its burst five HRMC, and then they can race across the battlefield with the Uber Four Commandos or the Puppet Bots, um, and they they fight very well midfield with the Morans and the Liberto. Um, just a really strong list. Um, to to defend and attack and to do um, uh, uh, classifieds and, and, and objective presses and also the heckler there to put out the fast panda and um, jazz and billy just to um, hack you so um, I think that this list um, one thing I probably have forgotten to put in it um, I think I he probably had a TR bot. No, he he sorry he had a um he had a missile bot instead of the Liberto. So this is this is a different version of the list that I sort of run into. But um, my opponent definitely was running the um yeah. So I, I think instead of having the puppet puppet master mine layer and the Liberto, he had the um the the missile bot the guided missile bot because I remember he did actually get a guided missile off on me this game. But um, yeah, the, the list is no fun to play against. Um, it's just a, a real problem with, with Infinity in general and N4. Um, but um, a couple of things which are, are kind of fortunate for me here is that um, the mission and the map were actually reasonably suited to me because this is Frostbite we're going to be playing. And Frostbite has an exclusion zone which stops the Morans from being as effective. They've got to take the time to move into the midfield. And a lot of stuff in his army is really going to die to the cold from Frostbite. So that's the other thing. He's got to move his stuff into the exclusion zone and it will die. So really the only things that can survive out there are going to be his Snow Tracker, which is a specifically nominated model, and also the Tag and the Puppet Bots. And if if I can take second turn and then move out and destroy those things, that will allow me the win. So um, I thought that if I can go second, um, I'd actually have a reasonable shot against this because my my list with the Agima and, uh, and, and Atalanta was actually designed around this particular map for some reason. And um, if I could just play passively enough and like keep just enough stuff alive through it, I'd have a chance to move out into the midfield and win it. So my opponent does indeed go first, and his first act is to race across the table with the Uberfall Commandos and try and just rip me up with the, um, the Putniks. And let's have a look at a clip um, showing how that went. After that, I couldn't do anything. Like, I tried, but I was too far behind. Is that the second right. shot skill? Yep, so they moved four, all right, and then I'll go ahead and use... Hang on, um, oh. I'm, I'm gonna missile them. Oh, so you do have a hidden deployment missile launcher. Yeah, see Gima. They gave him a new thing. Yeah, so you can see you just over the, the edge of this. He's meant to be a little bit sure. further to the right, just so that he can get most of that bridge. But he's got a hit, so let's see if he hits the Chimera. Needs a 16. Yep. So they only have to take one wound for the guys clipped by that. And I'm, I think I'm wondering if the guy at the back there. Because of total immunity. Yep. 
Yeah, it looks like just the one guy. Yeah, well, yeah. the important one, right? So she's um, armor one. Yep. Oh, all right. And the guy behind her? Yep. Not that it matters. You never know. So he's they're both unconscious. A little bit of good luck there with the good old Agima, but you can start to appreciate how the Agima can be quite useful in slowing your opponent down and punishing them and, and just sort of keeping them on their side of the table. Um, the Uberfall Commando is still extremely broken as a unit because total immunity means that, you know, if you don't get it on that second short skill so they can't dodge it, um, you know, then you have a chance, but if you're just shooting them out in the open and it's their first short skill and they can dodge for the second one, I mean, they're, they're dodging on quite a, quite a high number so they can easily avoid the Gamer, but they're also total immunity so if the if as long as the chimera passes her armor save then she just gets another go at it um so it was kind of lucky that i i managed to get that off but still um it was a really good way of shutting down his, his sort of first alpha strike um you know picking up a few points stopping him from having an order for the rest of the game on that unit um and just wasting the couple of orders he did spend on them because they died on that bridge um it actually blocked the way from to move through them because you can't end your movement on your own unconscious model so so when he tried to move out, move out with his tag, he just got absolutely nothing done, just shooting against flash pulse bots and stuff like that. So slowing down that first Nomad Alpha Strike, so crucial. What he did do later, though, is he eventually managed to move out with his Heckler and, of course, uh, go after some juicy stuff. Let's have a look at his next attempt to take me down. All right, so I'll move four here, arrows. No. All right, and then what I'll do is I'll reveal a Heckler. Yep. And we'll throw down a fast panda. As you do. These guys aren't specialists, are they? No. They're just kind of annoying troops. Right. Then I'll fire up an order on Billy. And we'll go ahead and... Jazz, you mean? What's that? You mean Jazz? Yeah, uh, sorry, thanks. Yep. Jazz. Yep, that's the one. Um... Yeah, well, Spotlight... What is it? Pencilia. Pen yeah, Pencilia. Okay. She will uh, try to reset. Here comes the reset. Oh, failed. And you've passed? No, I, 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 got it. I don't think I did, but I'm going to look. Well, it's, um, it's Jazz, right? So. Oh, yeah, whip 14. That's a crit, actually. Easy. Yep. All right. Then I'll fire off. I'll activate the missile bot and nice. fire off a missile at her. Um, let's just see what she can do. So Penthesilia. Will power 13, physical 11, dodge plus 2 inches. Um, uh, is it worth dodging? Or is it better to just reset? Um, I'll just take the dodge. Okay. Come to dodge. Uh, six. Not bad. Hopefully you roll really low. Four. Ooh, I made it. You made it, yeah. I'll go ahead and convert. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. I do get to move her. Okay. To dodge. Um, I'm not too sure if I want to, but... Um, I will. She's going to come over here. Yep. Alright, and then I'll... I converted my last order over here. And then we'll go ahead and try it again with okay. the missile. Here comes the dodge. Been lucky this turn so far. Oh, my luck has failed. So Bye. three saves. If I can pass um, one of them, then I could revive her. So please pass one. 16 looks okay. So she goes unconscious. So what he was able to do there is he was able to use his, uh, his hacking through the repeater laid down by the, the heckler to get that guided missile bot um, blowing up Penthesilia. And Penthesilia is the snow tracker, meaning that she's uh, got an additional order from that and she's able to survive the killer cold in the middle of the exclusion zone of the table. So it was really quite important that she lived and luckily managed to survive that guided missile launch in terms of her not being removed. I mean, she still was rendered unconscious by it, but McKeon is right behind her. So in my following turn, McKeon then pulls out and, and revives her and she moves somewhere else. We shoot the repeater and 
all of this is just slowing my opponent down. Like he's he's moving out with you before commando, they get shot. The tags just running into some flash spots and doing nothing. He brings out the heckler and puts down the 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 fast panda and then makes Penthesilia unconscious and I managed to bring her back. My Atalanta is revealing shooting his TR bot, my Agima is still around to get shot by the tag, and, and it's just a little bit of a trade-off, and we eventually get towards the end of the game where it's my opponent has run out of time, it's his last last turn, and he has to secure the middle of the table with something that's not going to die to the cold, so he moves out with his tag and his puppet bots, which is a strong play, I've got my Mark IV uh, proxy with HMG out in the middle there, which picked off a Moran. He destroys that, and he just camps in the middle with two puppet bots and a tag, and I've basically got my entire army, and that's the whole strategy to beat this list on a mission like Frostbite. You've got to slow the game down, make sure that you know, you're not giving away too much material early on, and then you can make a really decisive play in turn three, where you're, you've got the last turn, they can't retaliate, and that's exactly what needs to happen. So, with my opponent camping the middle of the table with his um, Salamandra, I believe in Suppression Fire, if I recall correctly, and it's got a couple of um, puppet bots there. It's time for me to, to, to move in and make my play, and that's where the smoke goes down from the Mimodon, and Atalanta moves in position to try and blap that tag. Let's see if that works. Crit. Very good. Flip over a regular order with Atlanta. She's going to move as far as she can to see the tag uh, without coming into within 16. Yeah, so she, it's somewhere she can't back see here. him. Can't she? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, good point. I pick up the smoke just to. This might be in my way here. Um, yeah, okay. So she'll if, have to come if you closer. bring her back. Yeah, if you bring her back. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. It's just the template was definitely. And she can see past this, uh, this decompression yeah. zone. Right, um, then she'll shoot you. Okay, I'll shoot back. All right, let's check that range. It is a beyond 16, so we're both in good range. I'm ignoring the smoke. Um, you're up against, oh, but I'm not ignoring the suppression fire. So you're minus three for long range suppression, minus, uh, assuming you want to keep suppression. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you're up against smoke cover, Lawrence, you're on twos, on three dice. Um, so I got two hits. I'm going to use armor piercing rounds if that's okay. Yeah, so yep. that's double action, right? So four shots? No, not double action because um, armor piercing. Oh, so okay, two. so yep. two shots. Yep. But I do have cover, so yep. um, they'll be on sevens total. Yep. Uh, or you might need might need nines, actually. Um, oh, I meant like I have plus oh, seven. Oh, armor seven, it's, yep. it's four, yeah. Yeah, four and then three for cover. Yep. So it's plus seven to these rolls. Well, uh, so a 13 and a 14, that's not enough, right? It's damage 15. I think you're dead. Yeah. Wow. Done. Holy shit. Okay. Unconscious. That was big. Oh. So with um, Atalanta getting the clutch kill on the Salamandra, all I really had to do is move something into the middle of the table and have more points than two Papa bots and... What I was able to do is come around with um, with McCann actually and throw smoke in the way and just really jam up that position where the puppet bots were with smoke and then Penthesilia having revived her earlier, which was absolutely huge. She's able to move through. She's the snow tracker, so she's able to move through, get into position, um, turn on like the, the the press the button for you know turning hitting the hitting the, the zone basically and um, kill one of the the puppet bots at the end. I think it was, and I managed to get a, a really good decisive uh, of win there. So. Um, in some ways, on paper, it's surprising to beat that Nomad list, but in practice, um, I, I did have um, a really good shot at it, given the map and the, the mission and the army list that I had built for it, and I did get a little bit lucky there. Um, so you can kind of see how hard it would have been to beat a, a, an army list like that had the mission been different and the map been different, and I just, you know, not been that lucky. If he had just wiped Penthesilia off the board, or if the uh, Chimera had just passed its armor save or something like that, um, it's just so hard to beat that particular Nomad list. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of keen to try it one time at a tournament. I feel like, you know, it just has a little bit of a bad matchup against Ariadna, but that's really the only thing. And if you can play really, really well, I'm pretty sure um, you could, could particularly purpose build a secondary Nomad's list to deal with uh, Ariadna a bit better, and I think that would be the, the way to go.
Anyway, moving into game five, I got to play against an opponent that I'd never played against before, um, who was also running Morat. So we get, I'm up against Morat again, and having a look at what he's running, this is just an approximation of his list. It's a little bit different from the, the previous Morat uh, play that we encountered, because we're not really up against that Datarazzi link. But um, he's splitting his list into a few different sort of uh, Harris teams here. Kornak, Suryat, and Dartok. And this is engineering deck, so it's about um, pressing the buttons generally around the field, but also getting into that room at the end. So um, the thing that I don't really love about this is that Kornak is just hanging out with the Suryat um, for shooting, and you're missing out on the Suryat HMG, which I think is a really big um, tool. That, that burst five in the link team is really good active turn. And then you've got the Yaogat, who's maximizing the plus one burst, and he's just doing that with the help of a Kaitok, I think. The Yaogat, I've, I've got the, the, the groups wrong, but the Yaogat went along with like Anyat and a Kaitok uh, and I think an Osnat or something like that. I think it was Anyat, Kaitok, uh, Yaogat in the same group here. Um, the Razyat looks really good on paper. We tried him a lot at the start of N4, but it be, he becomes so predictable. Like I was looking at my opponent's list. He took the first turn and I was looking at that big gap in his list. And I know that Morats don't have any hidden deployments. So you can easily deduce that he's got a Razyat and you can play accordingly and it becomes so predictable. So that's why a lot of really good players don't really use the Razyat in Combined Army or Morats. The way I personally prefer to play, play Morats, by the way, I like to take the Surya HMG Lieutenant because he's doing the same thing as Kornak because he's got Lieutenant, you know, plus one order. And it, even though he doesn't have Stratagos, you use a NCO Trooper to actually still use those orders. So it becomes more efficient. But unlike Kornak, you've got Burst 5 and an HMG. So you're, you're at least fulfilling that active turn shooting role. And you can still have the Yalgat in there. You can still defend well with the Kytox and you have the Dartok in there. And you can still take Pretters and things like that. Um, so I find that's just a bit more efficient way to play um, Morats. But um, let's just have a look at um, the, the, the game here, game five. My opponent's going first. Um, again, I just really wanted to have second turn in so many of these missions because the missions really are much more winnable um, if you can defend well and go second. And I'm playing a list that has hidden deployment Agima and hidden deployment Atalanta. So, um, you know, they really help quite a bit when defending. Um, especially with Atalanta's shock immunity because you can revive her. But let's take a look at how the first part of the game went. Okay, um, I'll spend an order from group two. Um, Atlanta is going to uh, just idle, and the purpose of that is to generate an aero from this Datarazzi. Uh, that Datarazzi is going to do the only thing he can to try and survive this, which is to dodge. All right, I'll blap him twice with my double action round sniper. So that's two hits, 11 and 16. I'm dodging on a 14. Pretty good roll, beats the 11, so only two saves. So uh, yep. Passes them both. He is alive. He could gut back behind the thing. He is a morite. He'll have to take a whip check before he, he runs away. He's going to take his religious check. Uh, whip 12, I believe. Passes it, so he can pull back. Uh, let, sight. I'm just going to check that whip. Yes, so he is going to move three inches. It'll be two with the guts check. It's not. It's not a dodge. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, two inches. Quite a way though. There. Obviously, clip the building in the process. Obviously. Okay, spending an order from group one, I'm going to move my digger four inches to here. Any arrows yep. to him? I do not think anyone has line of sight to him. He'll carry on to here. Then we shall spend a new order, and he's going to uh, generate a zone of control arrow from your Razyat once he reaches this particular spot, like that. Well, the Razyat would have seen him. No, you're in, you're in close but, combat. You're in close combat, so... Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't... Can I hit the Agima as a reaction? 
No, because the A game, A game is not pro provoking an arrow, and the arrow has to target the thing that's uh, actively spinning the order. So the only only arrow I can do is a dodge. Yes, I believe. Yep. So I will dodge. Okay, I'm going to continue moving four inches until I get to here. Note that this does not get into the Kytox line of sight yet. Yep, I will dodge on a forty. Uh, he fails his dodge. Okay. If it made any difference. All right, spinning a new order. I am going to go prone, and I'm going to. I have to do this, otherwise the the, Ky the Kytox can fire long range. So I'm going to come to here. Would you like another dodge? Yeah. All right, where you go. I'll move into close combat, so I'll be in close combat unless you get the dodge. Fails. I do not get the dodge. Okay, flipping a new Lovely. order, I'm going to bash you with my um, my weapon. Uh, weapon this system. is the bigger, which is hitting me, isn't it? It is. So, APCC plus one burst. So we're both CC21, we both have Natural Born Warrior, so it's just straight rolls, but I'm on three dice, you're on one, because I've got the help of the Agima, and I've got a plus one burst. I am going to de-charge you. Very good. That's the right move. So it. Just need to make a really right. high, high roll. Let's do it. So it's three to one. Two! So I've got a crit and two hits. That will be four saves. Uh, you're AP, aren't you? Yep. So my armor goes down to one. And you are plus one damage to this? Um, am I? Yeah, plus one damage. So damage 14. Uh, the Razia has been wiped off the table. Okay, guys, probably should have filled you in on sort of how we got to that particular part of the game. In his first turn, he had moved up with a link team that had involved a Kaitok and Anyat and um, I think um, his Yalgat. And I managed to hit him with the Agima and just nuke like one of his troopers there. I think I managed to take out the Yalgat with the splash damage. So he then brings on the Raziat behind the Agima, even though it's in line of sight of Walker or something like that. And he gets hit by a flash pulse, but he still manages to tie up the Agima with the Raziat anyway. So when it we turned around to my turn, I was able to, to rush at him with the digger and just managed to break in there, go prone, slide underneath the wall and kill the Raziat in close combat. So another situation where diggers can be extremely useful. You know, you've got a, a, got something which can beat just about anything in close combat um, in the active turn with your plus one burst. And even though the Raziat's uh, an absolute monster in close combat, the, the diggers, with the help of like another close combatant, can actually have burst three and just uh, crush something and freeze up the Agima to do some more shooting. Atalanta, of course, is on the other side of the uh, the deployment zone, as you guys can probably see from that clip, and she is going up against the, the Dartok and Kornak and the Suyat heavy rocket launcher. In my opponent's first turn, when he moved out with the Dartok, Dartok to take the objective, he um, I, I revealed Atalanta just as he was pressing the button, and he decided to press the button instead of dodging. So Atalanta shoots the Dartok, and the Dartok presses the button, and then he decides to move in and reform the Link team with like a Rindak or something, um, because there's heavy rocket launcher is going after um, like Atalanta at long range and, and dies. So um, later on, he comes back with the paramedic again and revives the um, the 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 Surya again and goes after me a second time. But again, you know, Atalanta even without total reaction um, is just a monster, especially at long range. She's got cover, she's got shock immunity, and she's hitting on an 18s. Let's have a look at how he does. So I am going to spend a command token. Very good. To reform this link. Excellent. With the Surya as the link leader, but it is still not going to include the Rindak. Okay. <clears throat> Gonna spend a regular order. Alright. On this link team. The Suryat is go with the Suryat being the link leader. Suryat is going to slide down this side so that he's still touching it at all points. Yep. Staying in cover from Atalanta. Understood. One point. And then he's going to go slightly towards that corner. Lovely. Shoot what him, is Atalanta's around? I'm going to shoot her with three heavy rocket launches in blast mode. Very good. 
Uh, so I believe... He's still well out of range. 32 is good range. Yeah. Okay. Sevens, though. Let's see if seven. Any sevens? Four is a hit. So I'm on an 18, so I might not be able to pass this. I do, though. So two saves. He's armor seven, effectively. So looking for eights. Or nines, maybe. Takes a wound is uh, linked in breaks. He goes back unconscious. Okay, might be a job for the Rindak, possibly, at some stage. So coming back to our Atalanta for a second, um, I think one question that uh, some people in the audience are going to be asking is, why don't you take the total reaction version of Atalanta, where she can fire twice in the reactive turn instead of the hidden deployment Atalanta? And I think for low levels of play and intermediate level of infinity, the total reaction Atalanta seems like the better choice. But at high levels of play, when you look at people who are actually including Atalanta and reaching the, the higher placements at the end of an ITS event, these guys are usually using hidden deployment Atalanta, and it, it's it's a it's a bit subtle, it's a bit complex. And the, the idea is that with total reaction Atalanta, even though she is very, very strong, you're still giving your opponent the ability to actively just choose their best piece to go after her. And even if that piece is just a humble total reaction bot where you're firing an HMG um, on 11s or maybe 14s if you've got um, uh, assisted fire. Atalanta's blapping you back at two dice on 18s. She's still really difficult to beat, but you can just keep reviving the thing, like just healing it with an engineer. Um, and sometimes you're going after it with an HMG and a link team, like a Zuyong with the burst five. And it just makes it much less reliable. You're going to get value out of Atalanta. But with the hidden deployment version, even though it's just one dice, you can spring her and just like really bring that trap out when it's at your advantage and when your opponent can least afford uh, at least uh, afford to dodge or spend orders on it or sometimes when they're on their second short skill the surprise and the the, the deterrence the 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 ability to make your opponent avoid certain parts of the battle battlefield because they know that she might be there in terms of your ability and your finesse to actually get stuff done at a higher level of play when both players know what the options are she is just flatly a better choice. So even with burst one, managing to get the job done there. What happens later on in this game is that my opponent is kind of floundering against my deployment zone, not really getting much of my guys killed. He does, you know, pick up um, an objective um, on, on his side of the table. So I think he manages to just to move out and get three objectives completed to my one. But then I have the final turn. So I can move out and capture another of them. Another of them. So on my left flank, I've got my two, you know, buttons pressed on his left flank. He's got two, his two buttons pressed. And it's just the, the room which is empty with no buttons pressed in there. So... On my turn three, it's already a draw, effectively. I can simply move into range of his HVT for, to pick up the capture HVT classified, and then it's just a matter of seeing if I can go for a major victory by moving Penthesilia into the room. And uh, although Kornak is next to the room and can dodge into the room, I also have a proxy mark two, which I can send in there. And I'm gonna show you guys a bit of a longer clip about how the final um, you know, part of this game plays out, because it's a fun one. Okay. So Kornak would have got a dodge for you moving into the room then. All right, well, it's it's done then. I'm going to roll for clicking the button, you get a dodge. So I'm going to roll for the button. Yeah. I fail, and you've passed. He succeeds. Does he have enough speed to get there? He is three inches. So he moves three just inside the door. Wow. All right, we've got a game. We've got a game. This fire team, however, is broken. Because he's moved out of... Uh, sorry, it goes down to a duo. Yeah. I believe. Between the Rindak and the um, Dartok. All right, so we're both just in the room. We've both got two consoles. I've still got the classifieds, so I can still take the win, but now it just gets a little bit harder for me to get to the right number of points. I was hoping for 5 TP. Now it's getting a yep. little more awkward. I'm just hoping for one from this game. So, are you happy with the facing for these guys? Is that where they're actually facing? Uh, right? 
So the Dartok is looking, should be from this corner here yeah. to this corner here. And the Rindak should be this corner here straight, uh, sorry, basically further round. So this corner over to here. Just saying that because this post it could come all the way around the back and sneak around your other objective. <laughs> it's, it'll take yeah. ages. Six orders. I'd get maybe one attempt. Like eight, one, two, sorry, yeah. three, four, five, so maybe one or two attempts. Uh, the, so the Rindak would have would see you here, but if you move across that line, he wouldn't be able to see you past that. Okay. <laughs> so stupid. Oh, okay. <clears throat> if I can attack Kornak in a way that doesn't allow him to splash Penthesilia with the flamethrower, then I'm okay. I... All right, so I'm just going to yeah. make the safest play first. Spending the tactical awareness yep. order on the uh, the Daleth, it's going to move here. And I don't think anybody can see that. Yeah. No. So that secures your HPT, which means that currently I'd have plus one on you for the objective points. Yep. Yeah, I got a little bit bloodthirsty with the Datarazi over here and forgot that I was wanting him to stay there to secure your HVT as well. Right. Okay, so spending an order with my post -driven. I'm going to come yep. uh, 1.4 to here, 6 inches, yep. six to there, and then like a couple of it here. Any arrows? I don't think there are. Nope. So I'm going to attempt to do net undermine. Okay. So I'm going to roll for that. Uh, remind me what net undermine is. A trooper whose troop classification is, is elite troop, which I am. Yep. Uh, must spend a short skill and succeed at a whip check while totally inside of the enemy half of the table. Right. So I've got both okay. classifiers now. Spending a new order, we are going to move, and this trooper does have stealth. So I'm going to come to here. Yep. And then, because you don't have any arrows, I'm going to keep coming over to here. All right. Okay. <sighs> Spending another one. Yep. I'll come 1.3 to here, and then a little bit further around to see you. Okay. So... You got boarding shotgun, pistol. Obviously, you're not using pistol. You'll be using boarding shotgun. Two dice on boarding shotgun. On nineteens. So I can flame throw you, or I can. I think safest for me is to dodge with Kornak. Okay. Because if I shoot you with heavy pistol, you simply boarding yeah, shotgun template. template. If I flamethrow you, you go boarding action, uh, lay down template again. Yeah. Because your simple goal with her is to get Kornak out of that room. So Kornak is going to dodge. Right, so I'm going to put down the uh, the shots, rolling to hit with a shotgun. Yep. Looking for 19s. I am on a 13. So 17 and, and a 9. Crit. Okay. Uh, crit. Where does he want to so go? So Kornak is going to dodge. Uh, Kornak is going to dodge 3 inches so that he is base to base with Penthesilea. Perfect. Okay, uh, the next shot, the next order, spinning on, on, on here is going to go into the postman. Yep. I'm just going to move up to touch the console. Yep. What do you want to do? Uh, dodge. I'll try and click the button. So 
so we're going to click the button. Got a seven. Uh, rolling for dodge. Uh, one. So I succeed. Ah, oh, now is three inches round into your proxy? No, I'm going to stay in, stay in base to base with Penth Slayer. Okay. All right. Um, so, because the proxy has NWI, I will spend an order on Pethicillia, and I will attack Cornet in close yep. combat with the monofilament blade. I will. I will hit you in close combat as well. Right. So I don't have uh, natural born warrior, but I do have um, CC minus six. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to come down to twenty because of your MA. You're going to go up to 25 because of your MA, then down by 6 because of my defense, uh, you're under 19. I have no MA. Okay, that's a problem for you. You're going to go down to um, 16 then. Yes. I have Natural Born Warrior, I don't have MA. Natural Born Warrior won't work on a negative 6 ability. I think that's why they put it no. out. So let's roll. So I am 16. This for me. All right, mono so is, is only a 12, so you have a legit chance to beat me here. Yeah? I'm a save. Yep, he's fine. 17. And I'll spend the very last order in that group to swing it again. You ready? Here's my roll. Uh, 20. Um, Just to mark these things up, I'm going to berserk. No, that, that's something you have to spend in your active turn. Oh, is it an active turn only? Yep. I thought it was a com uh, close combat one. Okay, so you've criticaled, yep. so I need to roll a six. Uh, 16. 16. Two nope. saves. Yeah, because you don't have uh, martial artists, do you? No. Just yes. the mono sword. Yes, you do. So I am more than 12. No, no, uh, it's not going to give any bonus to that. Oh, well, sorry. He's dead. I, I mean, you've rolled a 12, so we can just take him off. Guys, coming into the sixth and final game of the tournament, I had, um, you know, drawn my first game, lost my second game, and then I'd won three more after that. So it's uh, three wins, a loss, and a draw. And for the final game, coming up against a, a player called Stanex, who I'd played against one time before, um, the bat reps on my YouTube channel, it was Ikari Company versus Cosmoflot, which I just barely managed to win. Um, I'm up against his Combined Army, and Combined Army, as you guys know, is an absolutely S tier killer faction at the moment. Just um, enormous. And there were so many people playing Combined Army this event. And so many of them just playing the hard out net decked lists. This is a rough approximation of my opponent's list. Just very roughly what he had. And the only thing about this list which was um, kind of an eyebrow raiser and that's uh, sort of an off meta pick is his decision to take the um, the boarding version of Shishkin. Um, Shishkin is an e extremely good piece. I, I love her. I think she's an absolute killer and um, just such a solid pick for a combined army list. But the heavy infantry version of her is a bit questionable because you're swapping a nano screen for higher armor but um, you're paying a lot more points for that and you're making her hackable as a result. I'm going to show you guys a bit of a clip shortly about Shishkin moving out and, and attacking me. But um, this is, yeah, it's just, I, I don't love it. Um, you, you really have to have a bit more of a game plan about why you'd want to give up the nano screen and pay a whole bunch of extra points for the sake of this. I mean, the... The, the the thing that she has going for her is that she's armor four and she can benefit from cover naturally so potentially armor seven which is better than the shishkin being in partial cover and not really using the nano screen but the extra points god i mean it's 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 a big difference um i think just to just to explain this i'll have to go and find out how much the uh, the other shishkin is so 63 for the red fury versus 51 54, sorry, excuse me, 54. 
So that is a difference of nine points. Nine points is absolutely massive in infinity. Like it's absolutely a huge number of points. So to spend that, having an upgrade in armor, going from armor one to armor four while you're naturally in cover, but losing the nano screen as you're moving out, um, and also being hackable, and then costing nine points more. It's just, ugh, I, I, I don't love it, I'm sorry. My opponent, obviously still a very good player and otherwise also a very good list. You're net decking this where you've got Bit and Guess fires the repeater, then the anathematic hacks you, and then you know, the missile bot rains down the missiles. So it supplies my opponents going first, I'm fine with that. Bit and Kess move out, they fire the pitcher and they shoot Penthesilia and blows up Penthesilia. Luckily not making her deleted, like she goes unconscious, so McKeon can heal her. But um, right after Bit and Kiss do that, um, Atalanta reveals Snipes Bit. Game plan the entire time, my opponent gets no supply crates initially um, because my stuff's slowing him down and I've got like flash bots in the right places. But in turn two... That's when my opponent moves out with Shishkin, and she moves in a position to shoot Atalanta, who has successfully taken out Bit and Kiss. And I decided to make a bit of a play here. And I all I really wanted to do was just slow him down, make sure he doesn't get too much done. So I'm re revealing the Agima at the exact moment that he's attacking Atalanta. So I've got the Agima and Atalanta both shooting Shishkin, and Shishkin's having to spend the remaining orders just gunning them both down. And I'm okay with losing both of them. The Agima's fine to lose. The Atalanta, I mean, she's got. Uh, shock immunity so she could potentially be revived with the youth bot right behind her with um, with McKeon but if I can just get my opponent to a position where he's slowed down enough that I could just race out there with um, specialists and grab the boxes I will win but if she can push us through mows down everybody and kills my specialists then I you know will not win that game let's just take a look at how this this particular uh, situation plays out Okay, um, I am going to reveal an Agima missile launcher, and he is here. So he's just barely got line of sight to her. And he's going to shoot a missile with armor piercing, and um, Atlanta's going to fire a double action round. Okay. So I guess I still have cover from both, right? Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be two shots into the Agima and two shots into Atlanta. Sounds good. Who do you want to roll for first? Uh, Atalanta. Okay. Here comes her shot. On 18 or on 15? Uh, only an 8. 9. So I got you. Well, at least that means I'm going to be able to heal her. Um, okay, I'll take my armor save. Uh, oh, she passes and she has courage. So I'll just stay standing and um, the Agima's shot. Uh, 5. Ooh. See if I get lucky. Ah. Uh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, two saves, and he doesn't have uh, shock immunity, unfortunately. Oh, good armor. Good armor. Okay. Uh, armor two. So he actually lives. So um, he has courage as well. So I may as well just stay there because it will cost me you more orders to kill him. Oh, that's that's fortunate. Both, both shoot. Okay, so two times Agima, two times Atalanta. So I'll roll Atalanta first. Let's see if she can get yep. something through. Oh my god. Only four. Uh, two hits. Okay, two saves for Atalanta. Let's see if she can pass them. Uh, pass one, so she's unconscious. Let's see if we can get lucky with the Agima. That's six. One, one it. Okay. One save. Is it a big one? It's not. Okay, he's dead. Um, let me just double check something. Yep, no, he's gone. Okay, that wasn't too bad. So, another rotor into chest screen. Okay, it'll flash pulse. Mm 
Okay, here comes the flash on a 16, only a 2. Did I hit? What did I roll? I rolled a two. Okay. So I take uh, two wounds. Mm -hmm. So, I guess I can bolt these things, right? Yeah. What does he want to do? Okay, so the proxy will um, flash pulse. Okay. Uh, he can't use the M grenades because it will affect himself. Is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, my hacker will carbonite. And the Myrmidon will dodge. Oh, you have a good here, okay. And what do you want to do? I'm gonna CC. Okay. So here comes the flash pulse from the proxy with a one. Yeah, so I'm gonna use the uh, identifier rate button. Where well, almost double action. Okay. Again, if it's not. What's the armor? Um. Yeah, it's probably uh, not much. No, it's still gonna be the double action. Okay. So damage again. All right, make your roll. Uh, I did. It's a four. Oh. Okay, so I take two saves. Mm -hmm. Uh, yep, he's killed. That'll give you some wounds. And I'll just see if I can get you with that carbonite. Mm -hmm. Yep, so two saves, I think. Six. Damage 13, right? Yeah, I think so. I'll have to check it. Cool. So at this point in the game, I think you guys can really appreciate I'm glad we've got this example. It's just like a really concrete example of why um, boarding action Shishkin with the, you know, additional armor is just like a little bit risky. So Shishkin, you know, moves in. Um, she has to get in range of my my repeater and my hacking just to take out this proxy mark five. She, she gains two wounds. So she's on four wounds. But she gets hacked and she's immobilized. And this gives me a chance to come back into the game. It's still difficult because he's move, moving in with his Datarats and he's like tying up my specialists and I've got no supply crates and I've still got to kill Shishkin. It's not enough to just isolate her with an Oblivion. It has to be a Carbonite so she can be shut down. Otherwise she can dodge out of close combat and she's still air rowing me and it just becomes an absolute nightmare. And in his final turn, he can move out with his Anathematic and you know pick up a supply crate. So um, it was still a pretty tough situation, but I think I, I think you guys can sort of appreciate here is if, if my opponent picked... The normal Shishkin saved nine points and spread that nine points on other, you know, valuable things elsewhere in his list and was not hackable from a, a Carbonite in that situation. It's a really bad situation for me because, you know, you've got Shishkin there who can just, just dodge anytime anybody uh, moves within zone of control and she can just um, use that last turn to move over and kill something that's grabbed a supply crate and grab it back. Uh, it's really, really bad. Um, elsewhere in the game, I mean, he's got uh, a, a Q drone which got shot by Atalanta. He's got one tiger creature, you know. You could have used that nine points to buff up some of the other things that he's using, which would have been real trouble. So coming into my um, quite crucial turn two, I've, I've got this Myrmidon which is uh, able to dodge in response to Shishkin. And the Myrmidon um, attacks her, given that she's actually completely locked down and, and immobilized, it just 
whacks her a couple of times with the double action close combat weapon and reduces her to like one wound left and then the Myrmidon runs out of orders and um, Penthesilia can move over and finish the job but she's got to run past it like a, a Necatron and she's terrible at throwing smoke grenades and then I've got my proxy mark 2 which needs to desperately go and grab a box but he's tied up in close combat with like a Dataratsi or something and I've got my Daleth nearby to, to shoot into close combat but it's, it's just really hairy so let's just have a, a look at the, uh, the clip and see how it all plays out and uh, three there, so she's gone 5.5. And she's just going to move to the edge of where the um, where the Ikadron's uh, range is. Sure. So you get a dodge, you get a reset with Shishkin, and I'm going to throw a smoke. So here comes my yeah, smoke. I can, yeah, I can just reset. Yep, so the smoke. I'm number six, number nine. Three. Oh, thank god, okay. Um, I might be able to get into close combat, but I doubt it. Um, so I'll spend I'll spend a regular order here, and I'm going to come. Um, can she fit? Is that close? Is that base to base? Yeah, probably. Okay. So she'll go there. Okay. I can just reset. Um, I will use the monofilament, so I got two attacks. Mm -hmm. That's my reset. Nope. So two hits. Yeah. Uh, nice. Okay. Um. I'll spend the tactical awareness order from the sensor bot, and it's going to break suppression fire, and it's going to move to see your um, data ratsy. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Uh, I'm in close combat. I'm okay. Well, you you're allowed to dodge. Oh yeah, right, because you don't have stealth. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna dodge. Right, I'll shoot you with the combi. So the mimetism and the targeted cancel, and I've got short range, but I'm minus six for. Um, close combat unfortunately which is unfortunate so I'll be hitting on eight I think mm -hmm. and I think on minus three okay Let's see if I get any eights oh critical so I shot my proxy twice and I shot you with a crit so you'll have to take two saves and I'll have to take two saves as well yes thank god and the two saves from the proxy this is actually kind of important Oh, pass one. Okay, feeling good, feeling good. NWI, right? Yeah. Woof, okay, that was a big play. Big play. All right. All right, after that amazing play there, Penthesilia just absolutely clutch, takes care of Shishkin. Penthesilia is able to move up um, next to the supply crate, grab it, bring it back. Um, we also had some really good luck clearing out the Dataratsi, so the Proxy Mark II in NWI, after taking a wound, is also able to move up, grab a supply crate, pull back. Um, the game is mine to win at this point. He's really just got the anathematic left. Um, what he's able to do in his final turn is able to, he's able to push out with the anathematic. He manages to go mark a state, moves past Atalanta's line of sight, um, puts spotlight onto McKayon, blows McKayon up with the T with the the the, the T drone, right? So the guided missile launcher puts me in loss of lieutenant for my final turn. Um, the anathematic has to actually go out of mark a state and move into like range of the objective to. Um, to, to, to range of like, Atlanta to, to pick up the, the supply crate and I think he got damaged on the way in or something like that so Atalanta shoots him on his very last order and actually kills the anathematic so game is easily won for me at this point um, but we we in my, my last turn with Lost Lieutenant I'm just going to show you guys the clip because Penthesilia is able to now move out like she drops the box, somebody else picks the box up off her, and Penthesilia is able to move across the battlefield with um, the help of the Netrod's orders, because they're veterans, even though you're a lost lieutenant, you get, you know, their orders are regular orders, and she can spend some command tokens on flipping uh, uh, irregular to regular. So, like, in the comical ending, let's just see how Penthesilia does with that last supply crate. And then the second to last order here, I'm going to... Drive uh, seven here and one here, so you get a free shot with um, the doctor. Uh, and this, and I'm going to dodge. 
Yeah, and this guy's gonna. You have one wound, right? Yep. I'm gonna pistol you. Okay. I am gonna dodge. So here's my dodge roll. A five. So, uh. Good range for a doctor worm, so on 11. Same as me. And a pistol. Uh, mimetism. Is that a crit? Mm, no. Because it's range. Uh, oh, it's minus three. It's a miss. Okay, yep. Okay, spin the last order. Um, I don't know if I can get to the supply box, but I'll try. So it's four to there. And. Nah, too far. Because mm. the nothing matter was back here. Okay, so that's my move. You want to shoot me again? I'm just going to. Um, I'm gonna dodge because the mine blows up as well. Yeah. So double pistol. Right. So the dodge. Okay. Uh, dodge just beats the mine. So that's the pistol. In the front. Then that's the shot from Doctor Wall. One hit. Yeah, Does she save? Yes. Okay. And I guess you can guards. Uh, I've got no orders. No, you can get from the shot. Probably. Ah, but it, it's the last order of the game, so... Oh, actually, I've got two command tokens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it should have stayed there. Um, so I'll spin a command token to turn somebody else's irregular order onto the, the supply box, and I'll just grab it. Oh, what I was thinking? Oh, yeah, right. And you can try even to control the HPT. Yeah, I'll just end here. Mm -hmm. uh, grabbing but is a short skill, right? Yeah, so you get to shoot me for free. Uh, template it's 8.5, not 8.3. Oh, yeah. Ooh. So, Dr. Home is gonna shoot you, and this guy is gonna flame tower. Okay, so I'll take the armor save against the flamethrower. Fine. <laughs> oh, God. And then wow. my shot. No, it doesn't get you. Because of mimetism. Yep. Yeah. Good game, my friend. That's it. That's all, that's all I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I'd actually get nine points then. Um, uh, why not ten? Because, oh, no, yeah, you're right. I did get both classifiers. Okay, yeah, so it's ten to one. Hey, guys, just want to say thank you to you for watching this review of IGL6 and my run with um, Aleph. I managed to get four wins, one loss, and one draw, which is probably more than I deserved, more than I expected given my lack of practice and preparation for this event. I want to say thank you to all of my opponents who were all very sporting dudes. A pleasure to play against um, the people who organized the TTS event. Um, there are a number of you guys. Um, having organized so many TT events myself, I appreciate like the, the effort that goes into the maps and the admin and the answering rules questions and just getting people organized and the promotion. So um, excellent job, guys. Well done. Um, congratulations to the winner, Norfolkot, for playing uh, Bakunin to come first place good job um and uh, Aleph uh, a real joy at the moment um kind of a bit more of a flexible army list I mean you're not just net decked into one way of playing Aleph and that's one thing I like them about them at the moment with combined army with nomads with cosmoflot Ariadna you're kind of just eh, there's like one way to play them whereas um Aleph seems to have a few different options you can go the Marut you can go Achilles you can take McKay on like you can take the mid-range kind of guys or the skewed to expensive stuff the, the light guys um there's still a lot of stuff which is kind of annoying about the faction you've got to take the net rods and the diggers and the flash bots but you know it's infinity it's in four it's what we've become used to um again hope you guys uh, enjoy this uh, for those of you who stuck through the full two hours of reporting um really appreciate you guys um yeah i'll i'll uh, see you again soon post some more videos uh, don't forget to check out table game fun times and um yeah let me know how your games go